Hello, my name is Cheryl Boyer, and I've worked in the industry for over 25 years, I'm a, and I'm currently working at Sinclair Technologies as a technical sales engineer. This presentation will cover the system design process for planning a new RF system or upgrading an existing system at a wireless or tower site. I will go through the system design methodology, which includes the information that is needed to begin the design process, the filtering requirements, and antenna features and selection process to be, guarantee a reliable public safety LMR system. The presentation will identify challenges that you will face during the planning and design phase and how to overcome them. Where do I start? This is a question that everybody will ask themselves. Keep the following questions in mind. Have you already upgraded an existing system? If so, have you replaced the antennas? And also, are you using a digitally modulated system? You will see why these questions are important as I go through the presentation. Following the basics, here are a few coverage questions to ask yourself. What areas need to have good communications and how many sites are needed to support this? And then here's a few capacity questions to ask yourself also. How many different user groups or agencies do I need to support? How many simultaneous users should I plan for? And how many channels or frequencies do I need? Gathering information and identifying challenges. Gathering detailed and accurate information is very important. Garbage in equals garbage out. This is true for pretty much everything in life. So missing information can be as bad as inaccurate information and will cause you issues. For example, when designing a system, the engineer needs to know how much antenna space isolation you will have so they can determine how much filtering is needed in order to provide enough total isolation for your system. If you are unsure and you just say, oh, I have plenty of space on my tower, so I'm confident I can get at least 55 dB of antenna space isolation, this is what your system will be designed for. Once you purchase and install a system, you experience some interference and realize you only have 40 dB of antenna space isolation. You may be having some communications issues because now your system doesn't have enough filtering to overcome the 15 dB difference in antenna space isolation. This is an example of why it is very important to gather as much detailed information as possible. If any of your specs change between the system design phase to implementation, please review it with your design engineer before purchasing the system. Here are some challenges and solutions that you may experience along your way. We will get into more details on each of these throughout the presentation. Some challenges that you may face are interference issues, intermodulation interference, which could be either passive or active, or receiver descents. Solutions to some of these challenges may be to make sure you have adequate filtering in your system, make sure you have the correct antenna features for your application, and that you have sufficient antenna space isolation. Here are some challenges and solutions that you may experience along the way. We will get into more details on each of these throughout the presentation. Some challenges that you may face are interference issues, intermodulation interference, which could be passive or active, or receiver descents. Solutions to some of these challenges may be to make sure you have adequate filtering in your system, make sure you have the correct antenna features for your application, and that you have sufficient antenna space isolation. When you start to gather information, you will need to identify existing or new site conditions, which include list all in-band frequencies that are on or near the site. These will be used in the analysis of your radio system. Are you contractually obligated to protect any existing receivers at the site? If yes, then these receivers will be included in the filtering and intermod analysis. Photos say a thousand words, and I can't stress this enough because it's always good to send photos of the new or existing antenna structures that you will be using. This can help identify any antenna mounting issues up front. How many transmit and receive antennas are you planning to use? And where on the antenna or where on the tower will these antennas be located? The engineer or design engineer will need to know what the antenna space isolations are for design purposes. 
For in-building systems, you want to be aware of your donor server antenna isolation or in order to prevent any feedback from occurring in your system. Filtering considerations can sometimes be complex. This is especially true for VHF systems where there is no band plan. Most often, a custom system will need to be designed to accommodate close frequency spacings. Custom systems will generally use a standard component, but configured in a way that will meet the needs of specific applications. These type of systems are designed for public safety professionals around the world. Identifying challenges. Are there any intermod issues that need to be addressed? The system should be free of any interfering third, fifth, and seventh order intermodulation products. Will the number of proposed antennas work for your application? Reasons why they may not work could be due to close transmit to transmit separations or intermod interference. Will the proposed spacing between TX and RX antennas work? And will they be spaced vertically or horizontally? We will get into more details on this in a bit. A single antenna that is used for both transmit and receive are prone to have intermod issues. Keeping intermod clear up and through the 11th order has been known to mitigate the intermod on single antenna systems. Single antenna systems require more filtering than systems with separate transmit and receive antennas because additional filtering is needed to make up for the lack of antenna space isolation. Single antenna systems will generally be larger in size and cost more because of this reason. What is the antenna space isolation required for reliable system operation? 45 dB is known to mitigate intermod beginning at the fifth order, and 35 dB is known to mitigate intermod beginning at the seventh order. How much space isolation does your proposed antenna arrangement provide? Vertically spaced antennas will typically provide more antenna space isolation than horizontally spaced antennas. Usually the antenna space isolation is not known, but it can be calculated using the tip to tail separation between the transmit and receive antennas. This can be done by the design engineer. And just to look at this example that's on the screen, you can see that there's two antennas here and they're mounted horizontally. And if this is transmit and a transmit antenna, then it's usually fine. But if this is transmit and a receive antenna, you're not gonna have very much antenna space isolation between these two antennas. So just keep that in mind. You either wanna keep them horizontally spaced further apart or keep them vertically spaced on the tower. So one here and then maybe one up here at the top. How much filtering does your system need to provide? The total isolation required minus your antenna space isolation will equal the amount of filtering you will need to purchase. This is what will be provided in your TX combiner and RX multi-coupler system. Wideband transmitter noise. So here on the screen, you can see an active transmitter. And then the RX frequency identified by this red arrow shows the received signal strength at that receiver. There will be concerns about this working properly and this is what you can do to correct it. What you're looking at at the screen is an unfiltered transmitter. And from looking at the image, you can see that there's TX wideband noise on both sides of the receiver. That's where all this noise is down here, which will result in interference. You can reduce the transmitter noise by putting filtering on the transmitter, as shown here. So what you're looking at here is a filtered transmitter, and the filtering must pass the desired TX frequency, as indicated by marker two here, and then eliminate TX noise at the receive frequency, as indicated by marker one. Receiver desensitization. Filtering is configured to prevent strong signals from entering your receiver and reduce intermod. Receiver descents can be caused by a strong signal on or near your receive frequency. And carrier suppression is the amount of isolation required to protect your receivers from these strong transmit signals. 
cavity filters and pre-selectors can be used to reduce the strong transmitter signals from overloading the receiver. Strong undesirable signals may cause interference to receiver, which cannot be filtered out or eliminated if it is on frequency. It may be able to be filtered out if it's near your receive frequency, but it'll depend on how close that undesirable signal is to your receive frequency and whether it can be filtered out or not. Receiver descends caused by intermodulation. This is a mixing of two or more signals that create multiples and products of frequencies and is considered to be active intermodulation. Filtering cannot reduce or minimize this type of intermod. So in order to determine if the multiples or products will interfere with the operation of your system, an intermod study should be performed. Any uh, in-band or on-site user frequencies should be included in this study um, to ensure that these transmitters are not a contributor to the intermod products. The intermod product frequency, frequencies may land on or near your system receiver frequency, producing descents that may lead to a dropped or missed call. This is extremely critical in public safety systems. Here are ways to reduce or minimize intermodulation. So one would be to move the offending frequency to another site. Another solution may be to change the offending frequency to a different frequency that won't contribute to the intermod. Provide isolation between the transmitter output stages by adding isolators if you don't already have them. Or finally, you could add additional transmit antennas to separate the offending transmitters between the antennas. This will help to reduce or eliminate fifth and seventh order intermod interference. But third order intermod is the most problematic because it has the highest amplitude and is the closest to the original frequency. Any third order intermod is strongly discouraged. And now you're looking at an example of receiver descents caused by passive intermodulation, or in other words, it's known as PIM, on a single antenna system. So here, when one tra transmitter was keyed up, so it's either F1 or F2, there were no issues. When both transmitters were keyed up at the same time, then R2, right down here, 158.88, experienced descents. And it was determined that the receiver descents was due to PIM. And why that is, is because this was a very old system and was not designed with PIM rated components. So normally system components are designed to minimize PIM and this problem would have been eliminated. Once all the filtering requirements are established, a system drawing is created like you see on the board here. And it will include all the system specifications. Uh, once drawing is complete, it is then sent to the customer to verify that all of their constraints and objectives have been met. And then once they confirm it, the system is ready to be quoted and purchased. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the antenna and the antenna selection process and what questions you should ask yourself. What antenna features are important to the public safety industry? What type of antenna should I choose? What antenna features are important to my application? And what do I need to look out for? So what type of base station antennas are available? So you can see them on the screen here. There's collinears, dipoles, panel antennas, yagis, ground plane, and corner reflectors. What is PIM and why is it important? PIM is generated when two or more signals mix together to create additional undesired frequencies or intermod products within the same frequency band. This may limit system range or possibly lead to a dropped or blocked call, and nobody wants that. The use of PIM rated antennas and combiners with a rating of minus 150 dBC will help to mitigate PIM issues. Some causes of PIM. PIM occurs in antenna components, in coax connectors and cables, and it's generally caused by rust, dirt, corrosion, oxidation, bad crimp joints, uh, loose connections. There's a, many reasons um, that can cause PIM. It can also be caused from nearby guy wires, metal roofing, uh, roof flashings, anchors, 
uh, there's many contributors. So junctions of dissimilar materials are a prime cause of, of PIN. So it could be anything like ferrites, nickel, and steel components that are used in the construction of antennas. So you gotta be very careful of this. The effects of PIM cannot be filtered out or eliminated. So what I would recommend is periodically checking and maintaining your site for any visible signs of rust and corrosion like you see up here on the screen. Um, you would wanna change these out so you can help eliminate any PIM issues. Peak instantaneous power or PIP. Uh, this is high voltages that are generated in multi-carrier digitally modulated systems and can damage system components over time. Either you see visible damage to the components or you will notice that your bit error rate will slowly go up. So as you can see on the screen here, these, these are damages uh, due to PIP. So you can see that this insulated wire really just burned apart. And then on this side, on the circuit board, you can see that there is an arc and it burned and damaged the circuit board. So obviously this will cause you issues. Typically occurs in P25 phase two, Tetra LMR, ODFM systems, and next gen. Some of the radios will allow you to use LSM with P25 phase one, which also requires PIP rated components. It is important that you choose a PIP rated antenna when using digitally modulated systems to avoid damage to your system, which may lead to a missed or drop call. And lastly, we're just gonna talk about uh, null fill and down tilt options in antennas. So the upper left image over here is an antenna without null fill and the one underneath it is with null fill. As you can see, the antenna with null fill has more power being redirected down towards the base of the tower. Antennas with null fill are used on tall towers or mountains to provide coverage closer down towards the base of the tower and to prevent too much of the signal from overshooting the nearest part of your intended coverage area. And one thing to note is that null fill does not affect fringe coverage. So sometimes that's very desirable. The upper right image here shows an antenna without down tilt, and the one below it is an antenna pattern with down tilt. As you can see here, uh, down tilt provides uniform coverage, reduction in coverage. So you can see the lobes starting to bend down here. And this may be beneficial when you have adjacent cells and you don't want your coverage to overlap. There are several down tilt options. Uh, one would be fixed electrical which this cannot be changed. So how you order your antenna is how it stays. Mechanical down tilt would be when you can actually change the brackets, adjusting the brackets on a tower to change your down tilt. And then there is remote electrical tilt, which allows you to set the down tilt of the antennas remotely. And what I suggest, if you don't really know what antenna that you wanna use, if you want down tilt, or you don't know how much down tilt, um, there's way to, ways to determine it, but uh, you can get the antenna patterns and run coverage maps to determine which options are the best for your particular application. And that pretty much concludes my presentation on planning a newer upgraded radio system. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to discuss anything in more details, please contact me at Sinclair Technologies. Thank you and have a good day.